Hi everybody, little Scotty here. Uh, I thought we'd talk about congenital aortic stenosis today. Um, it is uh, kind of a rare congenital defect, but it shares a lot of common, um, I don't know what the word is, common, you know, uh, facts and figures regarding aortic stenosis with adult aortic stenosis. The only thing is, is if a child is born with aortic stenosis, it progresses pretty quickly. And you'll find that um, they have to have the valve replaced at a much younger age. You know, I've seen valve replacements on five-year-olds. So um, depending upon the child and how they feel, most of the time they'll try to put a bovine valve in if they can, um, especially if they get to the point where the child is getting close to uh, childbearing years, if it's a little girl, obviously, um, because you don't want um, a pregnant mother on blood thinners. That's not a good thing. Now, if a mechanical val valve has to be installed, unfortunately, it's real risky to uh, get pregnant and go ahead with a full pregnancy and then delivery because you've got the thin blood and you can have a very massive bleed and then uh, things are bad. So I've rambled on enough about that, but here you can see I drew kind of a thickened aortic valve and obviously you'd have the rest of the uh, LV outflow track there. Um, thickened aortic valve can be, uh, you know, from something, you know, as simple as a bicuspid valve, um, but it also can be you know, a regular valve, but it's very thickened. And it may only open, you know, about that much. So you can have a full-size valve in only one area that opens. So the valves will be fused here and here. And this is the only area right here in the center that blood is getting out of. So let me show you some pictures. Okay, first picture I wanted to show you was of or is of um, the different types of aortic stenosis that a child can be born with. Um, sometimes they're not found out until later on, even in uh, early adulthood in their 20s, when the stenosis becomes um, significant enough for someone to pick up with a stethoscope. But there are different types. There is a subvalvular, oops, sorry, wrong button, subvalvular aortic stenosis. So it's kind of a little membrane usually that just crosses the LV outflow tract. Uh, sometimes it'll only have one aspect, so maybe this part is not there, it's open. But it just depends upon the child. If it's both sides, then obviously that makes for a smaller hole for blood flow to go through. Um, that's a form of aortic stenosis. It's just subvalvular diaphragm or ridge aortic stenosis. And then, obviously, we have the valvular stenosis or atresia. Um, atresia would be where the valve is just, you know, just not really, it doesn't really have the components of a valve. It just maybe is a small hole, and that's all that's there. Now, those children obviously would present much earlier, if not at birth, they would present. And this is a significant problem for uh, anybody who, you know, is presented at birth with this kind of defect. You uh, don't want to mess around. You might have to go in there and a lot of times they can repair the valve, but unfortunately when you repair the valve, the chances of it coming back are very, very significant. So um, I think most of the time, like I said, they go with a bovine valve. Um, I don't think they still use pig valves, but um, if they can, they'll go with a bovine valve. When the person gets into their 40s, then, you know, it's safe after they've gone through the childbearing years if it's a girl. And uh, they can put in a mechanical valve, which will last them longer. But again, they have to have the blood thinners. Now, up here, you see a supravalvular stenosis. So, supra means above. And then, like, subvalvular, which would be sub, would be below. And then the valvular. Now, supravalvular narrowing is very rare too. You don't see it too often, but when you see it, it's very easy to recognize. Now, I'm going to erase this real quick, and I'm going to show you what's important from an echo standpoint. 
Um, also, you know what, let me point this out too. They put this here too. And what happens is in a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you might get thickening like this on both sides. And what that'll do is produce a high velocity flow going through the ventricle. And that high velocity will act like aortic stenosis um, because you have this blood flow or blood that's down here that's going through at a fast motion. And you have to kind of um, almost imagine with your, you know, that there is a problem with the flow and that some blood is not getting through, which will decrease output, and that's a bad thing. So um, if you look at that, that's another form of stenosis. So let's get rid of that so I can show you what you need to do. In uh, On your machine, you'll have a pulse wave Doppler and a continuous wave Doppler. If you don't, you need to get another machine, and your or your machine is really old. I mean like 30 years old. So, um, take your pulsed wave Doppler, and I want you to start by using it down here. So you sample there, and that'll give you, you know, flow probably, you know, around one centimeter, or one meter per second. Now, the next sample volume should be up here, and you'll want to see what the velocity is here. Now because they're showing a little bit of stenosis there, you might get two or two and a half on your uh, Doppler. Sorry about the bad line. And then obviously you would go up here and you would sample before anything that looks the nice stenosis so you can get an LV outflow tract measurement because you're going to have to get that if there is suspected valvular stenosis. Now some people don't do a valve area when it's subvalvular uh, stenosis. Others do. It's, you know, you're still trying to get a, an idea of how big that hole is, so you can do it that way too. Um, so what you would do is take your continuous wave then, which actually looks like this, and you would sample through that valvular or through that subvalvular stenosis and see what velocity you get. Now, with the continuous wave, obviously, you might get, like, let's say, 4 meters per second. That's a significant gradient. Now, if the stenosis is valvular up here, when you go through with the continuous wave, now, this is if you have, you don't have subvalvular stenosis, if you just have regular valvular stenosis. Now, this may be as high as 4, could be even higher. I've seen them at 5. So at that point, then, obviously, you do a valve area, which if you don't know how to do a valve area, then, you know, go through it in the manual or ask a tech who's been there for a while how to do it. Um, I'm sure if you're doing adult patients, you know how to do a valve area. So no different with kids. You do the same kind of valve area. And then the last place you would sample with a continuous wave or a pulsed wave I would say st sample with a pulse wave first just to show them that there's an increase in velocity. So let's say that increase is to 3 or something of that nature. Then the supervalvular narrowing, let's say everything else is normal, the supervalvular narrowing might just be enough to cause a step up and then you still would have to put the continuous wave through this to see what that step up is. So remember on continuous wave Doppler, this little line here that they put on the screen really doesn't matter. That is not where you're sampling. The continuous wave Doppler takes the highest velocity. It could be here, it could be here, it could be here, and puts it on the screen when you sample. So. I've had arguments with doctors saying, how come you have left your continuous wave down here? It should be up here because the, you're, not, you're not really getting the velocity. And I'm like, no, you are getting the velocity because continuous wave is sampling along the line and taking the highest velocity and putting it on the screen. So you can remember that. What I would do is I would still put this, you know, in the area that you think is stenosed. 
that way the doctor doesn't have any questions for you and get you annoyed and make you want to punch him in the nose. Sorry, I've had experiences like that. So, um, that's a little bit about sampling and what you need to do. I'll show you some pictures of echoes too, so we'll get there. I'm already 10 minutes into this. I'm sorry guys, I just wanted to show you that one. Okay, this is from Mayo Clinic, and I always give Mayo Clinic credit because they have a good way of explaining things. I've always used this example to explain aortic stenosis. Now, if you were taking a garden hose, like, uh, whoops, did it again. If you're taking a garden hose, and let's say you got a normal garden hose with a normal opening, you have, if you were to compare that to an aortic valve, you would have normal flow going through that. So here's the normal flow going through it, and it's, you know, that's what we want. It's great normal flow. Now, if you were to take a cap, or your thumb, let's say, and put it over the hose, and occlude some of the flow going out, well, that's a sign that you have some mild aortic stenosis. Probably should put that in yellow. You should have some mild aortic stenosis. So there's some thickening here and here and here. Now, put the cap over there, and let's say this is even smaller. Um, and now you've got some thickening behind the the uh, obstruction, so the LV can get thickened. But this would be like covering the hose with your thumb about to the point where only a quarter of the uh, the valve or the your the flow is coming out next to your thumb. Here they're using real live metal caps that you would put on the hose. Um, I have seen these in the store, so I know they exist, and that's for like cleaning a sidewalk or something of that nature. And obviously you would have moderate aortic stenosis, so you get this thickening, and then you get a lot more thickening down here because the, steno or the stenosis is causing LVH, or left ventricular hypertrophy. Now here you see the size of the hole. That is tiny. That is really restricting the flow going out and then you end up with this, the severe aortic stenosis plus severe hypertrophy before the obstruction. So I always thought this was a good picture and a good way of explaining aortic stenosis. Okay, so here's your echo picture of aortic stenosis. Um, this looks like systole. I, there's no EKG, but it does look like systole. You can see that this is a very thickened valve and obviously doesn't work really well. This is your byproduct of an aortic stenosis diagnosis. Very thickened LV. And you can see down here even the posterior wall is thickened. So this is the first stage of aortic stenosis that is really, you start to think about replacing the valve because remember, the thicker the LV is the less room you have for blood flow to come out and go out the aorta. This kind of aortic stenosis can start to cause patients to pass out if they stand up too fast. Um, also, you know, if they strain, let's say they bend over to pick something up and they get real lightheaded and sometimes will even pass out. So this is the first stage. Well, this isn't a perfect example because it looks like the mitral valve is a little thick in two, but you can see this is a significantly stenotic aortic valve. Now in the next stage, you know, the first stage we saw the thickening of the LV. Now the next stage is when the LV starts to become dilated. When the LV becomes dilated, that's a sign that it's time to replace the valve. In fact, you really don't want to get to this point where it's so dilated because if it is that dilated, then you're, you worry about the cardiac output after you replace the valve because we don't know if there's been any damage to the LV by stretching it out that far. So you want to get that valve out of there and put a new valve in before you get to this point. Like the first picture when we had the hypertrophy, that's ideally when you want to replace the valve. Okay, last picture. Um, this one is a child that's born with uh, both pulmonary or pulmonic stenosis, you can say pulmonary, you can say pulmonic, it doesn't matter. So both valves are stenotic, and that's an issue, that's a real problem. Now, a lot of times they'll just go across the pulmonary valve and 
use a balloon and pop it open and hopefully that takes. Um, sometimes they have a um, stent that has a valve in it and they just push it up through the valve and then open the stent and that keeps the valve open with the new valve in the stent so that it'll work. Um, uh, for the longest time they just used the balloon but I think these new stents are really working out well for, for kids. Um, now this aorta, this almost looks like there's a problem with the ascending aorta that it might be abnormal. It looks a little thin, it looks like it's maybe not normal but that would be you know something to show the doc really good and make sure that they have some measurements for that. Um, and then you know you'll see the aortic valve really thick and this is just kind of an example with the little dot in the middle showing you that it's really significantly stenosed. But anyways, um, I hope you enjoyed this one. This is something that you won't see very often, I hope, because it's, it's kind of an emergency situation if you see congenital aortic stenosis on a baby, um, depending upon how significant the flow is. Um, if it's four meters per second, then they're going to have to do something pretty quickly. So um, you'll notice that the baby will have trouble feeding and all this other stuff, and that's when they'd make the determination to do something about it. So um, I'll try to think of the next one, and I hope you enjoyed this one, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Take care. I don't know who we is. It's just me. Anyhow, bye.